uh, an overview quickly of the Gospels. When you come, we've, I'm going to leave this up for just a minute and we'll pull it off. As, as John brought us through the Old Testament, and as we begin to consider and look at that overview, you got Matthew 1, you got a sheet in your divider and it says what on it? The New Testament between Malachi and Matthew. Well, some man put that there. Because when you come to the Gospels, you're just continuing the fulfillment of those five overview points. They're going to be beginning to be worked out. And when you come to the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you come to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he is the most unique and important person ever to have lived on earth. And you need to grasp that. And what the four Gospels are going to do is they're going to set forth his earthly life and ministry. And because he's our Savior, we're naturally interested in that, I would hope. Here at Southwest, we teach, well, it was Wednesday nights with the new job, now it's Sunday nights. We're teaching through the Gospels. We did Luke. That took four years. So I think I got Ephesians beat. Now we're in John, and we're a year and a half to two in that. We're, not, we're just getting into John 12. Okay, So when you look at the Gospels, you need to remember some things about the Gospels. Come over with me. to. You, by the way, you got Matthew 1? Look at verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's the first time in Scripture where he, he is named Jesus Christ. And it's in connection with what he's going to fulfill in the covenant with Abraham, of Abraham in the covenant of David. And what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are going to do is they are going to educate us on how he accomplishes that for the nation of Israel. We're here. We're in time past. Last night, what are the characteristics of time past? The big one is circumcision and uncircumcision. What's a... The operating system, the OS system back here, the law. What's the area of focus? The earth. By the way, why is it that way? Because what we just learned last hour about what the Old Testament's all about. See? So when you come, come over to Luke 16. When you come to the Gospels, there's some things that you need to remember. Now, I've got eight pages of notes, so I'm not, we're just going to read some things to you. And, and not run all the verses, um, because I do like to eat, and I do like food, and, and I like to eat. So you need to, to do some, just some reminder here with you. Uh, the, in the Gospels, and I'm going to take that down, because I'm going to write, I like to write on the board. By the way, do we use minions or do we use Avengers? Oh, there we go. That's the question. When you come to the Gospels, you, you come to a, a place that you're going to have to remember where you're at on the timeline. You're in time past. And if you don't remember that and think about that and pay attention to that, then when verses come up about ask and ye shall receive, knock and it shall be opened, all that becomes confusing because what are you doing? Why isn't it opening? I've been asking. I got the prayer of a mustard seed here. What's going on? Why isn't things moving? Well, you got to remember where you're at. So where are you? You're still in time past. You got Luke 16, right? Hold on to that. Run over back to Matthew 10. Matthew 10. I, we do a lot of holding and running here. When, when John asks about you got, you got five more minutes, I'm usually asking for how much? Ten. <laughs> A couple more verses, we're good? Okay, let's go. Matthew 10, last night, Dad pointed this verse out, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why does he say that? What's, it, what's going on in time past? Well, that middle wall of partition is up. The issue of circumcision is there. They're under the law. Go back to Luke 16. 
They're, you're, the, the folks in, in the Gospels are under the law. Salvation is still going through the nation of Israel to the Gentiles. We looked there last night at Mark 7 with the, with the Syrophoenician woman. And what does she say? Lord, go feed the kids, but don't forget about us dogs down here. We got to eat too. But they have to be filled, don't they? They have to be taken care of, and then it drifts down to you and I. The gospel being preached is the gospel of the kingdom. And when you remember, so there's some things you got to remember. We've come across, time passed. Now we're getting into the life and the ministry of the most unique person to ever walk and live on the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you, you want to know and you want to study and you want to understand what's going on. But there's some things that are happening in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke 16, look at verse 16 now. That is, it's an extension of what the prophets are dealing with and what the Old Testament's dealing with. But now there's, there's going to be a new stage set in Israel's life. Look at Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until who? Now that John is John the Baptist. And with John the Baptist, he marks a new beginning in the national life of Israel. He does not cancel the law and the prophets. It's going to be something new now. Because the law and the prophets were exclusively until who? Until John. But with, the, the, with, with John, and now, what by the way, come back to Matthew 3. Just hold on to Luke 16. Look at Matthew 3. When John, you go, to Luke, you go read Luke 1, and you see how John was, was born. He's six months ahead of, of, Mar, of, of, of his cousin, the Lord, and so forth. And you see all that. And when Zacharias is in the temple... And the angel speaks to him, you know, in Luke 1. That's the first time in over 400 years God had spoken to anyone audibly. He tells the writing prophets, Isaiah, the, the, the big five, actually the, 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 the prophets, Isaiah to Malachi. He says, go what? Note it in a tablet, write it in a book, because there's going to be a famine in the land of me speaking to you. No wonder Zacharias was a little shocked. When he says, hey, you're going to go home and have a kid, <laughs> you know. First time an angel spoke in so many years, over 400. So now John's born, he's up, he's running, Matthew 3, and the, verse 1, In those days John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is what? It's at hand. What did the prophet say? The kingdom is coming. It's, it's down there in the future. Now it's what? At hand, we have a new something new going on here. We have a we we have a new stage set. Go back to Luke 16. So when you talk about the gospels and you begin to look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you're on new ground with the nation of Israel because the prophets were talking about a future coming kingdom. John says it's what? At hand. If it's at hand, what can I do? I can go get it, can I? It's close. It's not at home on the kitchen counter. It's here. It's right here. I, I'm right there with it. Look at the rest of verse 16. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. The good news in, the, in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not that Christ died for your sins and was buried the third day and rose again. The good news is, is that the kingdom is at hand. What all the prophets were talking about, everything the Old Testament is pushing and laying out, guess what? It's right here, and the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, that's going to bring that into fulfillment was just born right over there with, to, to the Virgin Mary in the little town of Bethlehem. And he's the one. Go back there to Matt. Um, you know how you just kind of freeze? Yeah. Go to John. John 1. He's, where's that verse about him being the crier in the wilderness? Matthew 3 <laughs> was the next verse. 
You got John 1? Run back to Matthew 3. Hold on to John 1. I'm sorry. John 3, I'm sorry, Matthew 3, verse number 3. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah, saying, where's Isaiah? Old Testament. What's he saying? What's he going to be talking about now? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. It's Isaiah 40. See, what's John doing? Setting the stage. Somebody new's coming. And the one coming is going to be your prophet, your priest, and your king. He's going to be the man. He's the one. John 1. By the way, when you look in the Gospels, you'll see a neat little thing called, if you're still in Matthew 3, you can look down there. He's in, the, he's in Jordan doing what with them? Baptizing them. So now we got a water baptism going on. Now we've got something very special happening. If you look there at John 1, look over at verse number 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me. For he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made, what? Manifest to who? To Israel. Isn't that interesting? Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And that's an interesting way that verse says that. Because what does the word baptism mean? Well, most say what? Water. But what does the verse tell you that the baptism is accomplishing? To be made what? Manifest to who? To Israel. So he's baptizing with water. And what's he doing with the Lord? He's identifying who the Lord is as their Messiah. If you go down to verse 34, and I saw him bear record that this is the Son of God. There he is. And what got the job done? The identifier is water baptism. So baptism in Scripture means identification. We're going to identify you. If you come back, I should have had you hold Matthew 3. I'm so sorry. Go back to Matthew 3. Go back there to Matthew 3. So when John shows up, my point here is when John shows up, we're on new we're on virgin ground with Israel because the prophet said the voice of one crying in the wilderness is coming. Verse 3, there he is. Verse 5, by, by, by the way, verse 4, and the same John has his raiment of camel's hair and leather girdle and about his loins and his meat was locust with wild honey. There's a picture of Elijah. Okay, Verse 5, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, and all the regions round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. If you look at verse 11, I and John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Well, where does the baptism of the Holy Ghost come? That's Pentecost, Acts 2. That's John next hour, okay? But where does the fire baptism come? Well, verse 12 tells you, it's talking about out there in the second coming, in the ages to come. So John, by the way, if you look back up at verse 9, I'm sorry, verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generations of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath? John's the one that coins, writes down the to come issue. What's he talking about? A future event. What have the prophets been talking about? That future kingdom. John says, you know what's going to get, you know who's going to get all that done? Jesus Christ is. He's Emmanuel, God with you. He's the one, and he's doing this. And so the gospels, they come in now and they're going to paint a picture of the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in direct fulfillment to the prophets. But the picture there is painted so that Israel can see, can identify him. He's going to do some things. You ever wonder why the, the Lord does what he does? And you go back in the prophets and guess what it says? The Messiah, when he shows up, he's going to heal the lame, make the blind see, the lame walk, heal the lame, heal, uh, make the, cleanse the leper. Thank you. He's going to do all this. Luke 8, he's preaching and showing. He's doing what the gospel, what the Old Testament has said the Messiah is going to do. 
So the question comes up, why is there only four Gospels? Why not five? What about the Gospel of Enoch, or the Gospel of Judas, or Mary Magdalene, and all this stuff that just gets generated out there in Christian dumb, D-U-M-B, okay? All right, well, what's, well, there's a direct reason why there's only four. The four Gospels, they're going to paint a, 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 a portrait. Come over to John 21, the end, end of the Gospel of John. They're going to paint a picture that is a prophetic portrait of the most unique and wonderful person ever to live and be on the earth. Look at John 21. John 21, in the last verse, verse 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Wow, think about that. Because, by the way, in John, you only see eight miracles, which is like just a little bit of what is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because John's painting a picture. Matthew is painting a picture. Mark paints a certain picture. Luke paints a certain picture. And when you go back and look in the, script, in the prophets, come back with me to Zechariah chapter number 9. I just want to spend the, the next 15, 20 minutes with you just painting a picture quickly here of what the, why there's only four Gospels and what's going on here. Because when you come to the four Gospels, each writer is writing with a sp specific issue that has to be identified in the Lord to fulfill the prophets. The prophets. John gave you five issues going on over, over you know, big issues, okay? Here, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John say, on all those issues back there, here's the four that identify who Christ is. Matthew, do you know who Matthew was? He's a tax collector, wasn't he? He's a government guy. Matthew. Do you know who Mark was? Not too many people do. Who was Luke? He's a doctor, wasn't he? Mark was a servant. Mark was a worker. You see the folks working here? He worked. He's a worker, hard worker. By the way, have you ever read the book of Mark, Gospel of Mark? Every, other, every sentence begins, you say every, and then somebody will bring up one. <laughs> but if you go back and start the sentence, guess what it started with? And. And he did this, and he did this, and he did this. And, and you're wore out by chapter 2. It's like, my goodness, you know. He's active. John comes in, and it's going to, there's pictures. Look, you got Zechariah 9. Matthew is going to portray the Lord as king. Zechariah 9, verse number 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon the ass, the, upon the colt, the foal of an ass. That's an interesting thing there, isn't there? Look how he came into the city. We call that the Palm Sunday, don't we? We call that the triumphal entry. How's he coming in? On the white charger or just... Some folks were up at the Grand Canyon. You know, they got donkey rides down. I'm wondering how the donkey ride up is, you know. I can get down because momentum's going the right way, but coming up, that poor animal's got to have a good back and some strong legs to tote me up and down, you know. I'm so, I didn't, I've never been, but I, you know, you think about that. Why? Because we got a behold statement, and what does he say? Behold thy king. Here's Matthew. What is he? Matthew's a government guy. What does a government guy do? What's the governor say? What's the president? That's what we're doing. So he's going to portray the Lord as the king. It's an interesting thing, and Matthew Matthew is concerned with what does Jesus say? It 
say? What does he say? What is his proclamation? Because what do we want to know? We want to know what the king said, don't we? What's the king say? You're in Zechariah 9. Flip back to chapter 3. Chapter 3 of Zechariah 9. Zechariah, I'm sorry, Zechariah 3, verse number 8. Zechariah 3, 8. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, and for they are men wondered at, for behold, I will bring forth my servant. Yeah, we're going to get to the branch in just a minute, because there are four branch statements. What does Mark do? It's an interesting thing about the book of Mark. The book of Mark, it's all about what the Lord what does a servant do? What did the Lord do? What is he doing? What's going on here? He's, he's doing things. You know, it's interesting. Matthew has a genealogy because we need to know where the, king, the kingly line come from. Mark doesn't. Who cares where the servant came from? We don't care. We just want to know what. Can they get the job done? Come over. You're in Zechariah. Come back to chapter 6. Back to chapter 6. In verse number 12, you see, folks, there's a reason why there's only four Gospels. There are going to be four behold statements. So if there's four behold statements, guess how many branch statements there are? By the way, there are four carpenters, too. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Look at Zechariah 6, verse 12. And speak unto him, saying... Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man. What is, who is Luke again? It's Dr. Luke. You know what you're looking for? How does the Lord feel? Because as a man, what does a man do? Man feels. It's an interesting thing when you go down through the Gospel of Luke and you see Luke talks to Mary and Mary divulges great amount of information about the conception and the birth and everything. And, and Luke, he says that she pondered this in her heart. You don't find any of that other stuff, any, any of that information stuff, info in Matthew or Mark or John. Because usually what happens when you sit down with your doctor? You ask questions. You unload a little bit. Hey, this is what's going on. This is how I'm feeling. And Luke is able to come in and look at and see how the Lord felt, what was going on here, how he was thinking about things. Come over to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Am I going too fast? Zechariah 6, verse 12. 6, 12. Isaiah 40 and verse number 9. Isaiah 40 and verse number 9. O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up. Be not afraid, say unto the cities of Jehu, uh, Judah, Behold your God. It's an interesting issue. Who is the Lord Jesus Christ? He's the Son of God, isn't he? So John comes along, and you know what John says? The Lord says, I am. Well, who is the I am in Scripture? Jehovah. I am Jehovah. I am the true vine. Seven times in John he says, I am. And he lays them out for Israel. Why? Because Israel needs to know not only is he Emmanuel with us, God with us, but he is God. He looks over there in John 8, and he tells them, I don't know if it's John 8. It's John 11, verse 25. He just raised Lazarus from the dead. He says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. What just happened when, when you ever wonder about Lazarus? I, I do sometimes. He dies. Mary and Martha sin for the Lord. The Lord delays. 
a usual tactic. Let's Lazarus die. Now, could, a, could the Lord, from where the Lord was, say, don't die, Lazarus, and he'd have been healed and fine? Of course. But he does it to do what? To magnify and glorify who he is, therefore glorifying and magnifying who the Father is. So he shows up now, come out and greet him and hug on him, and you know, Martha and Mary both, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Why? Because as the resurrection and the life, what has no power over him? Death. So when he shows up, death does what? Leaves. Because now he's going to go and do what? He's, that's chapter 11 and chapter 12. He's going into Jerusalem. And what's he going to do in Jerusalem? He's going to die, but he's also going to do what? Ray, rise. He's showing them with Lazarus what's going to happen to him over here now. And you know what they do? We don't get it. I'm like, you don't get it. What do you mean? He's standing right there in front of you. Some do. The majority don't. You got a, a king, a servant, a man. You got him as God. Look quickly here. Look, uh, look over with me to uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Go back to Jeremiah. You see, folks, by the way, that's the, that's the picture right there. That's why there's only four Gospels. There, by the way, there is a fifth Gospel. Do you know who that is? Us, Paul. And I'll show you why here in just a second. The Gospel of the Grace of God. Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23 and verse number 5. Jeremiah 23 and verse number 5. Jeremiah 3, 25. 23, verse 5. <laughs> 20, 23, verse 5 of Jeremiah. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a, what? King. Guess what he is? He's a righteous branch, but he's a king. Look over at Zechariah. Well, hang on a second. Let's see. Yeah, Zechariah chapter 3 again. That verse we were looking at just a minute ago, where he says, My servant, the what? The branch. He's the servant. Okay, that's Zechariah 3, verse 8. You're in Zechariah. Look at chapter 6. Again, chapter 6. We've looked at these verses already. I stopped you before we finished. Zechariah 6, in verse number 12, he says, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. You see the capitals there? That's a title. That's who he is. He's the branch. You go over to Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4 and verse number 2. Isaiah 4 and verse number 2. In that day shall the branch of the Lord, by the way, it's capital L-O-R-D, so we're, who are we talking about? Jehovah the Son. Here he is, Jehovah. What is he? He's God. He's Jehovah. Isaiah 4 and verse number 2. By the way, if you keep reading that verse, in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Isn't that interesting? He's everything for them. They just don't recognize him that way. You know why? Because what does the prophet say? The Messiah is going to come back one day riding on a Big old horse, and what's he going to be doing? He's going to be doing what Alabama does every weekend, win. <laughs> See? Win, baby, win. That's what he's going to do. So what was Israel looking for? Sorry, Ohio. I'm sorry about that. Okay? What's he going to be looking for? He's going to be looking for, what are they looking for? They're looking for him to do, and yet he shows up riding on the back end of a baby donkey. Meek and lowly and mild, just... No, you know, Pilate says, hey, they say you're going to bring an army down here and beat us up. He goes, no, it's not time yet. <laughs> One day. <laughs> he says, no, that's not. If I wanted it, guess what would have happened? It would have happened. Look over with me to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter number 1. Ezekiel is right before Daniel. Ezekiel 1. Now, why this is so interesting is because of this passage right here. 
you want to understand the Gospels, if you're studying the Gospel of Matthew, what is the mind frame that you should be reading that in? He's the what? He's the king. So guess what we're going to have? We're going to have royalty on display. You go to Mark, what's he, what's he being pictured as there? The servant, washing feet, doing this, and boom, boom, boom. So guess what the, the mentality you're going to read about is going to be? Someone who's a servant. By the way, if you reign and rule in, in the Lord's earthly kingdom, do you know what you are? You are a servant. The, the, the disciples come to the Lord and say, Lord, you know, we're going to rule over everybody, right? And he goes, man, you think like the Gentiles. You're going to work in my kingdom. You're going to be serving. You're not going to be lording over all. By the way, in the, earth, in the heavenly places, you know how we're going to rule? Same way. Serving. You're not going to sit up there and bark orders at the angels. Hey, get over here and do this. You know, big old super on the job site. You're not going to do that at all. You're going to be serving. Now look at Ezekiel chapter 1, because there's an interesting thing there. How many cherubs are there? Five. There are five cherubs in your body. There are only five. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10. Ezekiel is down by the river Chabar. If you look at verse 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. You see that living creatures there? Hold on to chapter 1 and flip over to chapter 10 and verse 15. Chapter 10, what are the living creatures? Chapter 10, verse 15, and the what? Cherubs were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river Chabar. So if that verse says this is the creature, then what is the creature in chapter 1? Well, just simply read the verse. What did he say? This is a cherub. Chapter 10, verse 15, with 1, 5. They have likeness. In, go back to chapter 1. Look at verse 10, just for time's sake. As for the likeness of their face, they four had the face of a man... Does that look familiar? They had the face of a lion. Who's the lion? He's the king of the jungle, isn't he? All right. Had the face, uh, the face of a lion on the right side, and they had four, and they four had the face of an ox. Who, who's, what is an ox? Well, he's a worker, isn't he? Get him on the grind millstone, and off he goes. Keep feeding him. Left side, they four also had the face of a what? That majestic bird. We're down at the, we we're camping one year and up, in, up on the rim country, and there are eagles are everywhere up there. You know what an osprey is? Big old bird. They don't like eagle, eagles, and them don't get along. You know why? Because eagle moves into osprey nests to take over. It's an, we talked to the lady, the forest person watching, she goes, Yeah, you watch. Sure enough, you know what happens? I'm sitting there fishing catching nothing, and I look up, and the osprey and the eagle are going at it in midair, midair combat. You're talking about fascinating. Oh, my goodness. The osprey had come down, took my trout out of the water, went up. <laughs> it was right there. I was looking at him. Went up. That goofy eagle went in talons first and took that bird out of that, that fish out of that bird. And then that bird wasn't happy, and they went at it. And I'm sitting there going, where's my cell phone? I'm going to video this, you know. <laughs> And dropped my cell phone and broke it. You know how that goes. So, and, but what is that eagle? Boy, eagles are beautiful birds, aren't they? They're majestic. There they are. So you got a picture here of the cherub that sit around. There's four of them. They sit around. Come, come over with me to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 7. Revelation 4 and verse 7. Quickly here, we got just a few minutes. Revelation 4 and verse number 7. In Revelation 4, you're in the throne room of God. Verse 7, and the, four, and the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had the face of a man, the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and 
And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. These beasts, the cherubs, they sit on the four corners in the throne room. They don't rest. What are they protecting? They're protecting the integrity and the, if I say godhood, do you understand what I'm talking about? The character of who God is. Look at what they say. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. Does God need protecting from an invader? No, duh. But what, is, what are they doing? They're, they're demonstrating, they're glorifying, they're magnifying who the Godhead is. What does the Lord do? Colossians 1 tells us. He's the God, or Colossians 2, He's the Godhead bodily, isn't He? See, when the Lord comes and walks on the earth, what's He doing? He's taken the Godhead of, of, of all the character and all the, and there they are. Now come back with me to Isaiah chapter 14, because there's a fifth cherub, Isaiah 14. I think it's Isaiah 14, it might be Ezekiel. You know what, let's get Ezekiel 28, I'm sorry. I think that's where it is. Hang on a second. Yeah, Ezekiel 28. That's the one I was looking for. See, there's a fifth one. These four are matching the four picture, prophetic pictures of the Lord, demonstrating there He is. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. There He is. Boom. When I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm reading specific pictures. You ever wonder why one, one gospel says one thing and the same event's a little bit different? Because would the king think like a servant? Little different, little different pictures. How does God, I mean, could you imagine the, studying the gospel of John has been very wonderful because you begin to see how he thinks as God. Then you go look at these others and you go, wow, look, look at what was really going on. You know, what he was re really behind the scenes thinking about. You got Ezekiel, that can give you time to find 28. Look at verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the psalm full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now stop there. Who was in Eden? Well, you had Adam and Eve. You had the Lord. And who else? Satan. So you know right now that the king of Tyrus there. He's not the guy. It's some who's behind the king of Tyrus, which guess what? The timeline in Daniel 2, John looked at it with you, it's telling you who he is, see? Now he's going to fill up in every precious stone, verse 13 down. Look at verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that, what? Covereth. Now look at this. Look at verse number 12. I'm sorry, 13. Does he look anything like these guys? In that description, not at all. This cherub has a completely different job assignment. These guys are doing what? They're standing guard singing and on, on those four corners of the throne room doing what? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. They never rest. Look at him. He's beautiful, isn't he? What's he got in him? Some tabrets and pipes, and he's got music. He's got music going, doesn't he? What's this guy doing? He's leading the universe in the song, "Holy, Holy, Holy, Lord God Almighty." You, you see that? You see how this cherub's different than these guys? Hello. Okay. Now, what happened to him? Well. Verse 15, till iniquity was found in him, he falls. He comes up, that fifth guy, and he just come over to Ephesians chapter 2. He comes up there, and you know what he does? Lucifer falls, becomes the adversary, becomes Satan, has the eye, eye Romans Romans. Chapter 1, verse 25, takes the truth of God and turns it into a lie. And he deceives the upper echelon of the angelic host, gets them, they rebel. God says, that's fine, I'll fix your... Here's, 
Here's hell. That's, that's your judgment. Stops the rebellion. And he says, that's okay. I got a plan, man. And we're going to work this thing out, and we're going to go out. We're going to start here with man. We're going to work him all the way down. I'm telling you what I'm doing. That's the greatest thing about the Old Testament. He tells them what he's going to do. And then he does it, except for the secret. I'm getting there. <laughs> he demonstrates it in the cherub. He demonstrates it in the behold statements, in the branch statements. Here he comes. When the Lord looks at those Pharisees and says, Have you not read? What should they have been doing? Reading. Reading. They should, when he looks at Nicodemus and says, you don't know these things and you're a master of Israel, you're a teacher in Israel and you have no clue about what it is in the new birth and the new born again and the new covenant, where have you, what you been reading? He gave it all to them, except for that fifth guy. As Lucifer, as he stands and as he hovers, he's the anointed cherub that, what, covereth. By the way, the anointed, you know who that is? It's Christ. Better be careful, you know, when you say Christ is my co-pilot because there's two Christ going on. Be, be careful with that. But look at Ephesians 2. Look at verse number 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's our future. That's our home. That's where we're headed. That in the ages to come, he might, what's that word? Show. What was Lucifer doing as the anointed cherub that covered? What was he showing? Look at that beauty. Look at all that he was able to do. He was putting on display the wonderful creation of God the Creator, wasn't he? Look at that. But now look at, now Lucifer fell. He's gone. He comes over and reveals a secret, gives it to the Apostle Paul about the glorious gospel, the grace of God, this unsearchable issue that was not found in the prophets, it kept hidden in God. Now it's been made revealed. And look at what he's going to do with you and I, the body of Christ. Verse 7. He's going to do what? What's he going to do? He's going to put on display, isn't he? His awesomenesses, his wonderful grace. His, that's a made-up word, okay? I do that from time to time. Just ask, all right? <laughs> he, look at what he's done. His exceeding riches of his grace. He just took that fifth cherub and says, you know what? They're not going to look like him because that's Israel's program. These guys are the body. These are, my, look at, look at them. You guys okay? That's pretty good. I, it ain't time to eat. We got, I got four minutes. Now, finish the verse. The exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us through who? Through Christ Jesus. The one that came and took care of Israel and everything Israel needed and was Jehovah to them and will be out in the future. The same that then comes and dies at Calvary. You read those guys, they walk by and mock him and say, if you're the king, come on down. Boy, what, what brazen stuff. I'm just like, man, <laughs> gumption. <laughs> He dies and he buried and he rose again. Comes back and visits with the apostles. Gets on the other side there and says, this is what we're going to do. Opens our eyes. He, goes, he, he ascends on up into heaven. John will talk about Acts. Road to Damascus. Meets up with a, oh, Saul of Tarsus. You go read Acts 26 and he says, I got a job for you, buddy. You don't even... <laughs> You think that was good. Wait till this comes your way. And he begins to lay out the issues of the dispensational change. And he says, the man that matched these and looked like that is now going to be the Savior of all men without going through the nation of Israel. And that group of people, we'll call them the body of Christ, is going to be that fifth cherub 
that as in the ages to come, when the when the when the when the the city of Jerusalem, when the God city comes and sits here on the na- on the earth, I don't know if you've ever thought about how that would look, but when He comes and sits, who's up covering over all of that? The body of Christ. You see, folks, when you come to the gospel, you're on new ground, because the man that co- has come to do for Israel what Israel couldn't do for themselves and to help them and to move them forward to be his people. He's now here. But he's also there for you and I. And that picture, why are there four Gospels? Because there are four branch statements. There are four behold statements. There are four carpenter statements. There are other things going on here. Okay? Okay? When you come to the Gospels, you've got to remember you're still in time past. And you're in Israel's program. And because of that, you've got to be careful. Okay? All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for the study. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for everything we have in your Son. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's take about five minutes. Seriously, just.